So welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for Chapter 16. And in Chapter 16, we are going to be looking at a group of animals called mollusks. Now, mollusks are considered one of the most diverse groups of animals out there, second only to the group called arthropods. And the arthropods include the insects, the arachnids, and the crustaceans. Now before we actually get started with our discussion on mollusks, what we need to do is we need to establish that we are now talking about a group of animals that are considered coelomates, or sometimes they're called eucoelomates. Now what that means is that these animals actually have what we consider a true body cavity. Now back in chapter 14 we had discussed the flatworms and the flatworms, like this planarian that you see right here, they were considered a coelomates. And remember the letter A in front of this word coelomate actually meant without a body cavity. And so what they had is they had a gut tube that was surrounded by a very compact amount of parenchyma. And that parenchyma was mesodermal in origin. So that was that third germ layer that we had talked about back in chapter 14. Now the animals that we had talked about in chapter 18, they were considered pseudocelomates, and that would be the roundworm that you see right here. And this roundworm is considered a pseudocelomate, which means that it has what we call a false body cavity. Now it's considered a false body cavity because there is no mesoderm tissue that actually surrounds the gut tube of this animal. It does have a cavity, but again the big difference between this and this is there's no mesoderm tissue located here. Now the animals that we're going to be talking about in chapter um, 16, which are the mollusks, they are considered coelomates. And again, like I said before, they have a true body cavity. And the reason for that is because they do have mesoderm tissue that actually surrounds that gut tube. Now in addition to that tissue surrounding the gut tube, they also have a particular type of mesoderm called a mesentery. Now that mesentery, which you can see located right here in this diagram, is actually going to be used to suspend um, any of the organs that are found within that particular body cavity. So in this case, with this animal that you see, and the example here is an earthworm, they have a gut tube which runs down the middle of the animal, but that gut tube is being suspended within that cavity by these, this mesentery tissue. Now, in mollusks, what we need to understand here is that even though they are considered eucelomates or coelomates, the coelom that you will see in these animals is actually very, very small. Now the phylum mollusca, as I had said, is considered a very diverse or large group of animals. In fact, it contains over 90,000 living species in this group. And there's actually been over 70,000 fossil species that have been discovered up to this point. Now one of the unique characteristics of these animals is that they have a very soft body. Now when you're an animal that has a very soft body, you need to find a way to protect that body. And what most of these animals will have is they will have a shell that works to protect that soft tissue. Now some of the examples of mollusks that you see down here would be examples like the chitons, which is what you see right here. You can see a nudibranch, which a lot of the nudibranchs that you would find in the ocean are very colorful, so they pretty much stand out. It's kind of like a slug that you might find on land. Um, over here on the right you can see an example of a squid, which is an example of a mollusk. Over here would be considered a nautilus, again another example. Down here towards the lower right, this is a blue ringed octopus. This is a giant clam, and some of the giant clams can actually get to over a meter in length and weigh as much as 500 pounds, so they get pretty large. In fact, it's one of the largest mollusks that we have. Now over here on the left-hand side, this is an example of a terrestrial type of mollusk. So this is a land-dwelling mollusk. And so we have a snail, of course, and we have a slug right below that. So if you notice, most of the mollusks that we look at, they actually live in the water, but we do have a few that actually do live on land. Now what you're going to notice about most mollusks is that about 80% of these animals are going to be 10 centimeters in size, if not smaller. But the other 20% can actually be pretty large. In fact, there are some mollusks, like for example the giant squid that you see on the right hand side, that could get up to 900 kilograms, and that's actually about 2,000 pounds. 
And some of those mollusks that can get so large can get to be nearly 20 meters in length. In fact, some can get even larger. And 20 meters would be around 60, maybe 70 feet in length. Now, a lot of these animals are going to be considered herbivorous, which means they are considered plant eaters. And so a lot of these will be considered grazers. Um, there are a few out there that are considered predaceous carnivores. They will actually go out and eat other animals. A large number of these animals are considered filter feeders, for example, like the freshwater clam that you see down here towards the bottom. And there's even a few that actually have larval stages that are considered parasites. And again, if you look down here on the right, this right here is actually the larval stage of this freshwater clam. And this larval stage is actually embedded within the gills of a fish. So for a period of time, they will spend their time there parasitizing the fish that eventually they will drop off and establish themselves somewhere in the environment and grow into the adult stage. Now, as I had said before, most of these animals are considered marine. There definitely are a few terrestrial ones, like the slugs and the snails that we had talked about. And there's even a few of those, again, like you see on the right, that are considered freshwater. So when you look at the basic body plan of a mollusk, you're going to notice that it actually has three basic parts. The first part is going to be considered the head foot region of this animal. So if you look down here towards the bottom, this is a good generalized example of a mollusk. You're going to see right down here towards the bottom, this is considered the foot part of the animal. So the head would actually be this area right here. So both of those parts combined would be considered the head foot region. Now this region is going to contain the body parts that are going to be involved with feeding. Um, definitely most of the cephalic sensory organs are going to be found here. And to recall, cephalic means head. And a lot of the locomotor organs, in other words, the um, organs that would be used to help the um, animal move, are going to be found in this region as well. Now the second part of this body plan is the visceral mass. Now visceral tends to refer to any of the organs or systems that you would find in the animal. So this particular part of the animal, which is located primarily right here, is going to contain the digestive system, the circulatory system, respiratory system, and a lot of the reproductive organs that you would find in the animal. Now the third part of this body plan is considered the mantle cavity. And so there's going to be two folds of skin which are going to be used to protect the soft parts of the body. So in addition to the shell, we also have this structure called a mantle. And you can see the mantle right here. So right through here, this kind of um, very faint white line that you see right underneath the shell, that is considered the mantle and there's going to be two folds to that mantle. So these are going to sort of drape over and protect those visceral organs. Now the space between the mantle and the body wall, in other words the body that contains all of these organs, is going to be considered the mantle cavity. And you can see the mantle cavity located right here. Now one of the most unique and interesting aspects um, besides the soft body of these animals is they have a very interesting tongue-like structure, and that tongue-like structure is called a radula, and it's very unique to mollusks. All mollusks will have a radula except for the bivalves, and the bivalves would be animals such as the clams, maybe the mussels, um, a lot of them oysters that you would find in this group. These do not have the radula. Now this radula is a protruding, rasping, sort of tongue-like organ. And so over here on the right-hand side, you can see the radula right through here. And what they're going to do is they're actually going to push this radula out, and this radula is going to sort of be ribbon-like, and it has rows and rows of very tiny teeth. In fact, some of them have up to 250,000 teeth on this radula. And all of these radula, or these teeth on the radula, are going to point backwards. Now the radula is going to rasp off or scrape off particles of food from surfaces, and so that's how this animal is going to feed. Now this is going to serve sort of like a conveyor belt to move particles to the digestive tract of the animal. So what we have here is we have these teeth that are found on this radula. So as this radula is pushed out and sort of scraped along the surface, it's going to move all of that food to the back of this area of the animal and eventually find its way to the digestive tract. Now any teeth that happen to be worn away are going to be replaced um, quickly for that animal so they can actually replace their teeth. Now the pattern and number of teeth are often used to classify the type of mollusk that you would be looking at. Now what's really interesting is that not all mollusks have the same type of radula. In fact, 
a lot of radula have been specialized based on the environment that the animal lives in. Some of them have been specialized to actually bore or burrow into material. And in fact, there's one particular type of um, cone shell mollusk which actually uses the radula sort of like a harpoon to paralyze its prey. And you can kind of see the radula located right here in this cone shell mollusk off to the right hand side. So as I had said, one of the three main body parts of a mollusk is going to be its foot region. And in fact, in the beginning we had said there is sort of a combo head-foot part to this animal. Now most of the time the mollusk is going to have a foot that's going to be positioned ventrally on the body of the animal, so it's going to be below. It's going to function in attachment to the substrate or also it could possibly be used for locomotion depending on the type of mollusk that you're looking at. Now some of the modifications that you would see in mollusks would be, for example, in the limpets. An example of a limpet is right here. It's going to use its very thick, broad foot as a place of attachment on the substrate. Um, clams, for example, if you notice, this is a clam right over here to the right-hand side. They have sort of a hatchet-shaped foot. And as you see down here towards the bottom, we have a squib. It has a siphon that's being identified by this area right here. That siphon is actually a modified foot. Now, sometimes this foot is going to secrete a mucus, and this mucus is going to aid in adhering or adhesion to the substrate. Or sometimes it's going to help mollusks actually glide um, using cilia in, in association with that mucus across the surface. Now, some bivalves, like the clam that you see over to the right, can actually extend their foot hydraulically by actually engorging that foot with blood. And when they do that, they can actually burrow into the environment. So they can take that foot, burrow into the mud, burrow into the sand, or they could even enlarge the tip of the foot and actually use it as an anchor. And they could actually draw the animal forward. So they could use it sort of like a form of locomotion. Burrow in, then go ahead and retract it. It's going to help to pull that animal forward. Now there are some free swimming forms that actually have a modified foot that sort of looks like a wing or a fin-like swimming agent, so it can actually help to push that animal through the environment. Maybe not necessarily like a siphon, but more like the fin of a fish. So as we had said before, the mantle and the mantle cavity are pretty unique when discussing mollusks. Remember the mantle is a very thin layer of tissue. Sometimes it's referred to as a sheath of tissue that's going to be found on each side of the body. And one of the um, functions of this mantle is primarily to protect the visceral cavity or those visceral organs that are found inside of that animal. Now a second job of the mantle is to secrete the shell of the animal if a shell is present. Now when you talk about that mantle cavity, you're also talking about um, a cavity where from that mantle, you might get the development of gills if you happen to be an aquatic mollusk or the development of lungs if you are a terrestrial mollusk, like for example, like a snail or a slug. Now it says the exposed surface of the mantle could also function in gaseous exchange, which basically means in addition to the gills, in addition to the lungs, of course both of these are responsible for gas exchange, you could also have that exposed mantle helping to bring in oxygen and release CO2. So that gas exchange could actually occur here as well. Now in aquatic mollusks, there is a continuous flow of water that must be brought in to make sure that that animal remains very well oxygenated. And of course, in addition to that, for some mollusks that are considered filter feeders, it's also going to bring in food. Now, of course, if you bring in food, you're also going to produce weight. So sometimes that mantle cavity can actually also be used to help flush waste out of the body. So the products of the digestive, excretory, and reproductive systems all empty into that mantle cavity. So one of the interesting groups of mollusks that we need to make sure that we mention is the cephalopods. Now they're really interesting because when you talk about the cephalopods, these are animals that can actually move through the water pretty quickly. Now the cephalopods would include the squids and it would include the octopus. Now they're interesting because what they do is they actually use that mantle cavity along with the head region of the animal to create a process called jet propulsion. So what that simply means is they're going to push water out of that mantle cavity. All right? And when they do that, of course, it's going to help to move that animal through the environment. Now the mollusk gill 
has a very leaf-like filament. You guys will notice this when you actually dissect into your clams in lab. Now the cilia that are found on this gill are going to be used to propel water across the surface. Now this is going to be really important because the way that these animals actually absorb oxygen is through something called a countercurrent blood flow. Now if you look at the gill you're going to notice that you're going to have the direction of the seawater that's going to be flowing this way right through here and you can kind of see that with these blue arrows right here and the direction of the hemolyph which actually represents the blood is going to be flowing this way and so when you have these two items sort of like just kind of run into each other it actually allows that hemolyph that blood to take the oxygen out of the water and of course carry it to where it needs to go now in most mollusks two tenidia are going to be on opposite sides. Now the tenidia is simply another word for the gill of the mollusk. And you guys are going to see this term used when you get into lab. So this is going to form an incurrent and an excurrent chamber when you actually look at these animals. So an incurrent meaning bringing the water in, excurrent actually meaning to bring that water out. So one thing we need to again understand is that the mantle is really important when it comes down to the creation or the formation of the shell of the mollusk. If you notice here, we sort of have two views of shell formation. If you notice the uh, mantle, which is this area that you see right through here, and then we have the shell on the left hand side. But you're going to notice there's actually three different layers to this shell. This very light blue layer that you see right here is considered the youngest layer of the shell. This is called the nacre layer or nacre layer of the shell. This right here is going to be called the prismatic layer, so this layer is a little bit older. And this is going to be called the periostracum layer of the shell. So what you're going to notice on the right hand side is that in some cases for some mollusks, for example clams, oysters, and maybe some freshwater mussels, they will produce pearls. And these pearls are actually a result of the nacre layer that you see right here basically being layered around some sort of imperfection within the mantle cavity or the mantle itself. And that imperfection could be caused by the animal, it could be caused by a stray bit of shell, it could be caused by a sand grain, it's just sort of an irritation within that mantle layer. And so the animal is basically defending itself against that irritation by forming that nacre layer or that shell layer. Alright, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for chapter 16. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.